It's uh, lovely to be back with you again this morning, again whether that's uh, in person here uh, this morning or whether that is through 
uh, the technology that's available to to uh, to share uh, our morning together um, with those who are at home or traveling uh, as part of it. We find ourselves this morning um, getting ready for Lent. Um, if you haven't already got your ingredients for your pancakes ready, uh, just a reminder that that is on Tuesday uh, of this week. Um, it's always great actually because it, it puts the Women's World Day of Prayer on Friday. Uh, you've got Ash Wednesday and you've got pancakes on Tuesday. So this morning um, we will be spending part of our time just looking ahead at Lent, reminded of just our humanity, our frailty, uh, our flaws, our weakness, but also something of the majesty of Jesus. Um, as we prepare to step into um, that period of time that leads us to, to Easter, um, aware of just the glory of God, uh, our own weaknesses and our own need for him. So we sing together uh, as we start this morning, um, the words of the hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning, well, it's just after half past 10, uh, our song shall rise to thee. So let's um, rise uh, with our songs of worship to God.
Those words paint a picture uh, of God uh, in his holiness, God the Lord God Almighty. God in a, an image of, of heaven or of God's glory with all the saints around them casting down their crowns, everyone falling before him. That image of though the darkness may hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy. There is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love, in pure and purity. I am a, a massive Star Wars fan, and if uh, if you know anything of some of the the legends of the Star Wars and um, saga, and particularly the movies, the movies uh, in the, have a particular way of starting. Uh, all the music comes up. There's the trumpet fanfare. There's the scrolling text that sets the context for that particular episode. And as that disappears, um, it then usually goes on to just a, a view of space and of stars, but usually a, a spacecraft or spaceship comes in to take your attention. But in the newer series, the, the spacecraft or the, the camera pan down onto a world around it. And so this morning, as we uh, worship together, we're aware of the glory of God, but we're also aware of the world in which we live, the world of which we are a part, uh, of war, of injustice, of all sorts of things that are wrong and we wish were a different way. So we, we find ourselves this morning wanting to reach out and to recognize God in his holiness, but also asking for God's mercy for us uh, as his creation. Let us pray together. God, creator of every landscape, who shapes on the earth, gardens, fields, mountains, lush and green, who hollows out of rock the, the desert scrubland, who sets the seas in their mighty depths, who sends ice to carve out mountains. It's you, Creator God, that we worship this morning. For mystery and wonder have captured the eyes of our souls. You are the Creator of life above and below. It is you who sends rain to water the field, who placed the sun and the moon in the heights to lighten our world. It's you who cast from the earth creatures that breathe air, that fill the seas with so many forms of life. And it's you that we worship, for our senses are stirred to see and to touch the works of your hand. We recognize you as well, God, as creator of love and relationship, as God who lights the clouds with, with the rainbow, who promises after the rain a day washed new, who promised those who stood before us the presence of God, who is near us now to speak to us in cloud and in sunshine. And we worship you, for still you reach out to us in loving friendship and faithfulness. Heavenly Father, we're aware this morning of your might, of your glory, of your creation around us in all its magnificence. But we're also aware of the damage and the harm that we cause to your creation and to one another. We acknowledge our flaws, we acknowledge our feebleness, we acknowledge our lack of wisdom and we trust in your mercy, we trust in your steadfast faithfulness that as we turn to you acknowledging our wrongs, acknowledging our flaws, our weaknesses, that your loving faithfulness turns to us in our repentance and delivers us.
So this morning, whether we are at home, whether we are traveling, whether we are gathered here, we thank you for your presence and we ask that your presence might be very real to us, bringing us hope in the midst of difficulties, strength in the midst of weakness. We thank you that we can gather through the technology available to us as your family. And so wherever we are, we join with the words that Jesus taught us, that as we pray together to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to read together uh, one of the Psalms uh, this morning. It's the words from Psalm 25. Uh, again, if you're at home, uh, and you've got a, a Bible to hand, by all means, feel free to, to turn towards that. And um, for those of you that are here, um, the words are going to appear on the screen. Um, and uh, we'll just read through this. Uh, and feel free to either read the words aloud uh, as part of a declaration. This is one of those psalms that uh, sometimes I think it lends itself more to just speaking out uh, as a prayer rather than trying to understand um, the theology within it. So feel free to, to join with me as we, we read out the words um, contained within Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways, but according to your love remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, 
from all their troubles. Amen. It's one of those psalms that has a real blend as you go through it. There are parts of it feel as though they should be read quite quietly, solemnly, and without anyone else able to hear. But there's also moments of defiance, moments of, of confidence, of faith, of standing firm. Also moments maybe of, of moaning, and maybe in a positive way, of highlighting all the things that have gone wrong. So I'm going to give us an opportunity to moan. We're going to get a minute's moaning to start this morning. What I'd like you to do, and you know I'm afraid that I like doing this when I come to you, I like to get you to talk to one another. So if you are sat near someone that you're comfortable talking to, what I'd like you to do this morning is to very quickly, within one minute, to figure out what are the most painful injuries that happen within the house? So within your home, what are the most painful injuries that occur? Now, I'm thinking of things that will probably happen to all of us. I'm not necessarily thinking of the most serious. So I'm not thinking about, for example, um, I'm not thinking about, I'm not thinking about falling onto a, a knife board that's there, okay? That would be very serious. I'm talking about the ones that are really, really painful that might have less consequences. So for one minute, can you, if you're comfortable, turn to somebody that you're near and just get an idea of what you think is the most painful, painful injury you can have in the house. You've got a minute to talk to each other to see what you come up with. Then I want to hear what you've got uh, and then I'm going to tell you what I thought of. Away you go. Right, I wonder what injuries we have suffered that are really, really painful at home. I heard the phrase coming from down in here, depends what your pain threshold is. <laughs> I fully agree. I am going to put myself in the position that I have a very low pain threshold. I don't like painful things. Um, I know that most of you will have had more painful injuries than I've had and will have just kept going. But I wonder, what were the painful injuries that you talked about or that you thought of? Um, someone just shout them out or tell me what ones you may have thought of. Stubbing your toe. Stubbing your toe. Absolutely. I have another one that goes alongside that one, but stubbing your toe, especially when you're just in your bare feet or whatever, and it's usually for me stubbing my toe against the leg of my bed. And that, um, binding that one. Stubbing your toe, absolutely. I'll take that one and we're going to come back to that one. Anything else? Stumbling down the stairs. Stumbling down the stairs. Does that involve um, going down either on your back, your derriere, or or any other any other part apart from your feet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely agree on that one. And it's it's worse when you've got a, a long set of stairs to go down. It's not so bad if it's the last stair and you just end up sitting on it. It's when you bump your way the whole way. Any others? Get, getting hit by a chainsaw. I think that qualifies as both painful and serious. <laughs> yeah, that certainly would do it. Was, I presume the chainsaw was operating at the time. Oh, yeah. Okay. I have nothing to compare with that one. Um, so I don't, that would have done it. Stitches required? No glue. Glue? Okay. Modern day, aren't we? Yeah. Let me give you mine, actually, because you're going to laugh at mine in comparison to that, actually. Um, I can just go through. I, had, I think I had four that I thought were I thought were really funny. First of all, a paper cut. Now it doesn't compare with a chainsaw, and I fully acknowledge that. But there's something about a paper cut that you're just not expecting it. You think it's a bit of paper. There's nothing to it. It's floppy. It's damp. It just it get, well, it gets damp or whatever. It just goes, but it just is so painful. And one of the things is, it's 
They're often easy to forget about once you've got one as well. And then what happens? Then you brush it against something else, or you get a bit of lemon juice, you get a bit of vinegar, you put it into a bit of hot water or whatever, and it's stinging again thereafter. And it's one of those ones, and particularly, um, try not to get them this week. It's, it's, for me, it's more about cooking with chilies, is what I tend to do then. And um, Working in a school, I have too much paper, too many paper cuts. Cooking with chilies at home, it gets in and it just burns its way in. It would be the same with lemon juice this week. But why does it hurt so much? Well, mostly because our fingertips have more nerve fibers than most other parts of our bodies. A paper cut slices through the layer and exposes the sensitive nerve endings that are just underneath the skin layer, and it makes them sting. What can we do to fix it? Well, I think what I find is somebody told me is put it in ice cold water very quickly. Now, there's not always ice cold water around, but if you put it in, what it does is it pulls the, the, the nerve or the blood supply to the, the nerve endings away. It almost tries to freeze them, and it's great. Uh, but it is, it does stick around for a bit. So a paper cut is one of them. The head bang is another one. You know the way that sometimes you've opened a cupboard door, usually in the kitchen or whatever, you've then leant down to get something else from somewhere else, you stood up and bang, and you've absolutely clocked yourself on the head. Now in my family, we've had a habit before, of we've seen somebody doing it, we've gone to, to try to fuss around and make sure they're okay. That's the last thing I want when I've done that. If you're like me, you're sitting there and you're thinking, what, you, you feel, I feel an idiot. Because I know that I've done it to myself. I know, well, who else has opened the door? That was me that opened the cupboard door that did that. But it just really, really bangs. So the pain is actually amplified by the annoyance that I've done it. I guess what does make it worse is if you do it with somebody else, because you know what, if you do it on your own, you rub it, you hold it, and about five minutes later, you just get on with it and you think, at least nobody else has seen what I've done uh, as part of that. If it leaves an obvious mark, you have to explain it repeatedly what you did to yourself, but you can get away with that one. Other maybe silly or really painful ones, your funny bone. Banging your funny bone, I, I know my, my mom and my nan and my grandma always taught me, don't put your elbows on the table, okay, when you're eating. But you know the way sometimes you either bang it on a door frame or you sometimes bang it on the table and it's just in there and it shoots with pain. Now, it's short lived, 10 or 20 seconds, then it's like it never happened. But for those 10 or 20 seconds, it feels, I guess, a little bit like, almost like you're taking a chainsaw to your arm. And you think to yourself, it's almost as if my arm's been cut off. It might do what should be just a minor bump leaves us in agony. It's so short lived that, that with a funny bone injury, the key, I guess, is to know that the pain won't last long. It's just to bear those terrible few seconds. Why does it hurt so much? Well, actually, because your injury is not a bone. If you whack your elbow, you hit the, it's the ul, ulnar, ulnar, ulnar nerve within there, and it's one of the three main nerves that travels from our neck down to our hand. It's just in the groove in the bone, so, but when you bend your elbow, it's just exposed down there, which means when you've bent it, you can bang it. Short lived, shake it off, put your arms straight in and out, and it's gone. And then the last one, we've already said it, a stub toe, or for those of you with children or grandchildren, standing on a Lego brick. That's my absolute threshold I cannot cope with. Uh, as I said, especially at night if the lights are off. And the worst part is, again, if it is at night, if you do stub your toe or if you do stand on something sharp like that, you can't shout out because you don't want to wake everyone else around you. So you find yourself just scrunching everything up, grabbing hold of your foot or your toe and wanting to shout maybe to let some of the pain out, but not able to do so. Again, why does it hurt so much? Because there's so many sensory nerves on our tip of our toes or on the underside. There's no fatty tissue or muscles surrounding them. So when we hit it on a, a, at the end of a bed, that toe, when we stand on something, it is so painful. What do we do? We trick it to hurt the halt. So if you immediately start to massage the area, not just that one bit, but the whole way around your foot, then you create like a wave 
of sensations coming up. So whatever it is that's around your foot, don't just poke that little bit that you've done or don't just poke your toe. But if you massage all the other toes, if you massage the other part of the base of your toe, it sends such a wave of nerves up and down that you forget about it and that it overwhelms it. It helps the pain to subside faster. Jesus calls us to follow because God's kingdom is at hand. But that doesn't mean that life will always be sunshine, blue skies, Disney songbirds singing all the way around, a Mary Poppins world to live in. We have a responsibility within our families, our communities, however small or wide, to care for one another, to keep each other safe. But when things go wrong, when pain enters those relationships, God's character still remains true, kind, saving, merciful. Psalm 25 verses 5 and 6 said, Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Pain comes, pain hurts, pain will pass away. We're going to sing together as we continue our worship. Um, a song that maybe leads us towards Easter again. Um, a, a modern song written by Graham Kendrick. Meekness and majesty, manhood and deity, in perfect harmony, the man who is God. Let's stand as we sing together.
Testament reading this morning um, is taken from the beginning of Mark's Gospel, uh, from Mark chapter 1. Uh, Mark, who doesn't really do a lot of the, the Christmas story at all in, in terms of this, and, and this is part of uh, Mark's introduction um, to the, the Gospel, to the good news of Jesus. Just preceding this, um, he has talked about John the Baptist coming, preparing the way, uh, and then uh, he introduces Jesus uh, in this way. So from Mark chapter 1 and verses 9 to 15. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The bank robber was impossible to miss. In April 1995, he attacked and robbed two banks in Pittsburgh in, America, in the United States of America in broad daylight. Security cameras picked up really good images of his face because he wore no mask. Police made sure that the footage was quickly broadcast on the local news and within minutes, with such a clear image, a tip came in. And just after midnight, the police were knocking on the suspect's door. Identified as a man called MacArthur Wheeler, he was just abs he was absolutely incredulous. Repeatedly saying to the police, but I wore the juice. But I wore the juice. He subsequently told the police that he had rubbed lemon juice on his face to make it invisible to security cameras. Detectives investigating actually concluded that he wasn't delusional, he wasn't on drugs, he was just incredibly mistaken. Because we are knew that lemon juice was used as an invisible ink. It's that thing we do as children, isn't it? Where we get some lemon juice, we try to write with a, a sharp point or whatever, we try to write with it. As the lemon juice disappears, it becomes 95% invisible, but it's only then when you either hold it up to the light or you can shade over it that the lemon juice writing shows up. We all play those sorts of spy games with invisible ink. So Wheeler, knowing that it was used as an invisible ink, had decided then that logically that it would make his face invisible to cameras in the same way. He told the police that he had tested it out before the bank robberies, putting the lemon juice on his face and snapping a selfie with a Polaroid camera as it was in those days. He even showed the police the photos he had taken of how he was invisible and there was no, neither a face nor a body in the photo. Nobody ever really proved it, but the general feeling was that the lemon juice on his face and the lemon juice on his eyes had caused and stung his eyes so badly that when he had attempted to hold the camera in front of his face to take his own picture, because he couldn't see his face, he ended up missing with the photograph uh, so that his, neither his face nor his body appeared in the, the pictures. It stung so badly that he could barely see. And so he went to jail and probably would have passed the test or received the certificate at the end of the test of being really one of the dumbest criminals ever to attempt a bank robbery. Perhaps getting lemon juice uh, into a, a cut finger on this Tuesday might remind us a little bit of him and remind us about the tests. 
But what about pain that isn't physical? What about pain that's maybe emotional, psychological, or mental? I spent part of this week in school um, having to do GCSEs, well, not having to do them. Um, I'm not that smart, or uh, I haven't put myself through that sort of ordeal. But having to eventually uh, supervise and organize GCSE science exams for so many of our students. But for students who haven't sat exams of this sort of formal nature, because of what the pandemic has done for the past number of years, taking away that learning experience of them. So for much of the weeks before that, we've been spending time talking to our students about, yes, tests and exams are stressful, but this is how you manage that stress. This is how you manage the, the anxiety that goes with it. Trying to teach them that not all anxiety and stress is something to be got rid of, but that actually, at times, that stress can help us in our performance. But I've got to say, the tests are difficult and not something that I welcome at all. Even the simple things, like doing your MOT test. How many times have I sat um, with all sorts of thoughts going through my head? In the days when you used to watch the MOT being done with your car, now I have to stand outside or whatever. But you would, I would spend that entire 15 or 20 minutes thinking, he's going to find this, he's going to find this, he's going to fail on this, he's going to fail on this. And all the worry that goes with it. Sometimes it did, but most times it didn't. As a diabetic, I am subject to regular reviews as to how my medical condition is managed. In the early days of my diagnosis, I had to bring my own home testing results in, bring them to the practice nurse, the doctor or consultant, for them to look at. And it was like an interview or an exam all over again. Being honest, in the early days of trying to establish the control of my diabetic condition, I used to lie about the results, only to be challenged by the medical professional, and one of whom told me that in her experience, the phrase she used was, diabetics are habitual liars. And that hurt. But there's something about tests, about the pain that comes with those, that we now try to avoid at all costs. I now have, and I'll, I'll hear no ill spoken of her, um, a very friendly medical professional who still supports me, but challenges me as well when she sees the results that come through in those. I still don't look forward to all of them because I've got to expose myself or expose my control of my condition to the opinion of somebody else. And I don't like that vulnerability. We have, haven't we, that, that way of we cover up our vulnerability or it's, it's very rare that we allow ourselves to be vulnerable to people. I have a very professional, um, not so much a persona, but a very professional manner when I'm working in school. I very rarely actually talk about my home situation. And as principal of, of a school, um, people don't oft, often want to know about my home situation. And it's easier at times to try to keep that sort of professional manner within that, that professional exterior. But we all know the different friendships, the different relationships we have. And there are some within my workplace that I'm perfectly open with about saying, here's what's going on within my family. Here's the good things. Here's what's hard at the minute. And the closer, I guess, we get to home, the more we expose ourselves or allow people to see who we are and what's going on. Into the closeness of our immediate family, the closeness of loved ones or spouses if we have them. Um, and I guess they are the, the people that know us the best. But I'll always say, actually, my mom still knows me really well. But it's only then within ourselves and within our families that our relationships that we become exposed, we become revealed. Mark's Gospel opens traveling from Nazareth and Galilee to the banks of the River Jordan. From there to the desert and into that desert um, to a place of testing. 
Mark's very short, concise, quick, immediate manner of writing takes us through this like a whirlwind. It shows and sets out who Jesus is so quickly and within the space of six or seven verses we go from in the previous bit where John has come preparing the way, Jesus appears, is baptised, is tested, comes out from there and goes into Galilee proclaiming good news and calling the first disciples. Bang, bang, bang. Setting out who he is, the task he has come to fulfil. He's grown up in an uncherished town, is baptised in a river alongside so many others seeking renewal who were coming away from Jerusalem. His temptation is in a barren landscape, a desert landscape, and his preaching is in his familiar home territory of Galilee. Coming out of the water, Jesus, as according to Mark, rather than the crowd, hears the words that he is the beloved one. Jesus hears the Spirit speaking to him with identification to say, this or you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And with that identification, with that endorsement ringing in Jesus' ears, the Spirit leads him out into the wilderness, into that parched scrubland where he spends those 40 days. That time that, that we refer to as the temptation of Jesus, as the testing of Jesus. And we can all relate to feelings of temptation. But the same word that's used there for temptation, that is used for testing, and we wonder to ourselves, do we welcome those situations in which we know we will be tested? Or do we try to find a way out of them? Some of us relish the challenge of tests, but many of us would rather find the, the path of, of least resistance, the way through it. We're aware of the context with Ukraine and Russia um, that has, almost according to Mark's gospel, gone so quickly this week from where we were on Tuesday with just talking and, and nothing really happening to where we are this morning. I have a little bit of a vested interest and I claim nothing in comparison to the pain of the Ukrainian people. Uh, but my daughter's been studying in uh, Russia for since September with four weeks at home. She had gone back, she had spent four weeks in St. Petersburg in the north of Russia. She moved last Saturday to Moscow and found herself there as the situation started to spiral out of control. We were seeking all sorts of advice as to, well, what do we do uh, as parents? What should she be doing um, as a, a citizen there? And getting no advice until on Thursday afternoon, she got an email from her university saying, um, we're pausing the course, you need to get out of the country and you need to get out of the country as soon as possible. Now that caused a panic because we thought, how quickly can we get her from Moscow home? We spent much of Thursday night and Friday morning working through all of the paperwork because there is a significant amount of paperwork coming in or going into and coming out of Russia, trying to get flights sorted out, but it was all sorted. Uh, and we, we were working on the basis that um, yesterday, was it yesterday morning, yesterday mid-afternoon, uh, Alana and her friend that she'd been there with were supposed to be in the airport, getting on a flight, flying to Amsterdam. And we thought, and we, as I was in the local pharmacy, um, they were asking about Alana, was she home, where was she? And we said, well, she's not home yet. Um, and we said, they asked, was it worrying? We said, it is a little bit, but actually, she's due to be on a flight in about two hours time. As soon as she gets into Amsterdam, we'll be, we'll be content, we'll be happy. Sure enough, half an hour after we got home, she sent us the message to say her flight had been cancelled. Uh, they had no way out of Moscow. And we spent then yesterday afternoon, yesterday evening, last night, the early hours of this morning and the early hours of the dawn this morning, 
trying to find different options to get her out. And my wife at one stage said to me, um, this is the most difficult thing as parents that we've probably had to do in our entire lives. Wanting to be able to develop those heroic skills of flying like a superhero, to go to lift her like Superman and just to pull her out and to bring her and her friend back, but unable to do so. Listening to the upset within her, just saying to us, um, I just need to get out of the country. And as she described some of the things that were, that were there. A country that, that she loves, a people that she loves, but a political situation that was taking things out of all context. We find ourselves, and that's why I was looking on my phone today, we found ourselves just where she landed in Madrid, literally five minutes before uh, our service started. So we know that there is some relief for us and that most of the testing is over. And at some stage in the days and weeks that lie ahead, we will talk about it and we will figure out about what we've learned about ourselves as a family, about ourselves as individuals, as parents, and about what we would do differently the next time. Jesus went into an empty place for his testing. It felt so stressful within our house last night without other people around because we kept looking to each other, expecting us to find answers. But for Jesus, he went to that empty place, no distractions, no smartphones, no Facebook, no uh, social media, no newspapers, no TV, no radio. And sometimes it's in those times of quiet and stillness that the real testing comes. And so it was at, at three o'clock, just after three o'clock this morning, and I found myself lying awake thinking that I would know within the next hour and a half whether her next flight was going to be cancelled and whether we would have to start it all over again, knowing that actually there was almost no chance of flights out after today, or whether she would be in that place of safety. And it was in the stillness and the quietness that there was both real difficulty and I started to find some of the assurance of God. Jesus, from the testing there, of enforcing and putting in place that identification with the Spirit said, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. It was tested and Jesus came out from there confident and gets straight to work preaching the good news. With that confidence it says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. Jesus, having experienced that victory over the spiritual powers and authorities, over the temptations that were in the desert land, comes with that sort of confidence. But time and time again, we see Jesus through the years of his ministry, turning to prayer again, developing that relationship with God, finding within God that assurance, that strength, that anointing of the Holy Spirit within him, and turning time and time again to God, whatever the testing was that came his way. How much more so do we need to keep setting aside times for ourselves in our relationship with God to confess our flaws and our weaknesses, to acknowledge those parts of us that don't stand the test, but to allow us to find our assurance in God as to who God has called us to be. To hear God say to us through Jesus, we are his sons and daughters. Sons and daughters that our Father loves. With us, he is well pleased. That sort of that sort of trust, that belief that Mark talks about isn't just about believing the good news, saying, yes, I accept that that is the good news. I accept that that's what it is. But it's more than that. It's putting the trust 
It's that sort of, as my gut was churning through yesterday and today, it's that trust that brings a calm to that, that says no matter what, we place our confidence in God. No matter what. I still live in a, a first world experience and my pain is still very relative to the experience that's going on within uh, the country of the Ukraine at present. It's easier for me, um, knowing through a smartphone now that she's in Madrid, that she is relatively safe, that there is hope that she will get home. But for those uh, people, also for those just in whatever country where there is conflict, where their faith or their beliefs or their culture is under attack, that trust of saying that God is able to carry us beyond the squalls, beyond the storm, beyond the storms on the sea, to carry us over those temptations, those testing, those powers and authorities that seek to undermine our place as God's children and to restore God's grace and mercy to us. The psalmist found himself in a very precarious position as well. Enemies were overpowering, the treacherous were all around, and the sins of his youth were disturbing him. Given those circumstances, his reminder that God could be a last ditch effort to beg of God, but what is certain is that the psalmist states with that confidence that we mentioned, that God can help. The psalmist, someone whose situation is dire, whose need for aid is genuine, but whose certainty that God is the one who can provide is exemplary. In closing, I offer just some words from a song uh, written by uh, the contemporary Christian group Delirious. Uh, and it, the words went along like this, uh, it goes, as a prayer and as a song, investigate my life and make me clean. Shine upon the darkest place in me. To you, my life's an open book, so turn the page and take a look upon the life you've made. Always, my days, I'll praise. I'll fly away where heaven calls my name. I'll fly away, I'll never be the same. Investigate, excavate, recreate. Investigate my life and take me through. Shine upon the road that leads to you. I know you'd heard the words I'd say before I'd even lived one day. You knew the life you'd made, so always I'll praise. I'll re pardon. When I go, when I return, to see your holy fire burn upon the life you've made, always I'll praise. I placed within uh, the pocket of my trousers when Alana went away a stone. Um, partly, oops, don't lose it. Partly as a reminder, every so often when I put it into my pocket, but also there as a reminder that sometimes when things are difficult, when things knock our fingers, when things are tough, as a reminder that God's grace is still strong enough for that. Whatever your week, whatever your days ahead carry, whatever pain or testing comes our way, may we be reminded that God is God, that God continues to demonstrate his character and to transform us through his spirit. Not necessarily choosing the pain, but choosing to allow God to work through pain, to make us into the people he has called and equipped us to be. Let us pray. Lord our God, faithful and kind, you've always been our help. With and without our asking, with and without our recognition, you have been 
the one who has led us, who has carried us, who has formed us, who has transformed us. And for that, we're grateful. For the way that through history, people have found you to be faithful, find you to be true to your promise, find you to be true as a loving father who welcomes back your prodigal children. That as we turn to you with repentance, as we turn to you with belief, with that gut trust, you reach out and lift us with your arms. We ask for ourselves, we ask for those known to us, a knowledge of that steadfast love through difficult times. But in particular this morning, we ask it for the nations around Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, we ask, Father, for immediate steps, for wisdom, leadership, and a sense of your spirit intervening amongst the political leaders, the decision makers. We cry out, Father, and ask for wisdom, for leadership, and for your spirit to be heard. We pray for those suffering, for those suffering physically, for those suffering with anxiety, with trauma. And in the midst, Father, of this extreme testing and extreme trauma brought on by ourselves, brought on by our humanity, we ask that we will, and those in the midst of it, will find you. May we know your streams of mercy never ceasing. May they know your feet, your, your, your hand under their feet May they know your arms lifting them. Father, grant, as we've already asked, wisdom for us to bring this man-made testing to an end, but to find ways in which we can support, bring it to an end, but also to, to help you be known in the midst of it. So Father, take our words, take our lack of words, take our, our pain, our aching, our longing. And respond. For we ask this in the name of the one who was tested but who came to announce that time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Thank you, Father. Amen. We sing on our final hymn together this morning. Come thy fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Let's stand as we, we pray this together as we sing. <clears throat>
So let us take the words of the benediction and bless one another, whether here, at home, or far abroad, uh, and bring those words of blessing to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.